people are still coming in, so I thought I'd uh, entertain you a little bit. So what you've been watching here is uh, uh, a new, it's called entertainment shopping. And uh, it's called penny auctions is the generic name for it. And uh, so it's an auction in which uh, uh, the, uh, you pay for your bids. So if someone were to win this auction, they would get this camera, which uh, retails for $1,600. They would pay $4.68. But every time they bid, uh, I, I don't know exactly how much. On this auction, it might be 50 cents per bid. So let's say it's 50 cents. Um, so there's some $200 that ha the retailer has already made without selling this, because that's what the bids have. Uh, every time a bid is made, uh, the um, price, the auction price, the selling price increments by one. So uh, the reason I, I use this as an example is just to kill some time while people get seated. But uh, 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 this is an example of some of the things that I want to talk about, computational behavioral analysis. That uh, how do you model this? Uh, and people are starting to do that. There are a couple of papers uh, out of Stanford about this. Uh, there's a lot of data, so you could scrape this website and collect a lot of data about how people do it. So you could study this from an economic point of view over at the Tuck School of the Economics Department, say, what's the optimal thing for people to do? But uh, that's probably not what people really do. And what's the business model for the, the company? I think the other thing that, uh, the other reason that I wanted to show this was uh, it's very likely that uh, in a year this will be regulated away because uh, it just seems so ripe for fraud, and it's a form, really a form of gambling. Uh, OK. Now I've, I've already got my first challenge here. Uh, ah, there. So, uh, so that's a prelude. That's an example of uh, you know a system, multiple agents. How do you model it? Uh, can you model it analytically? Does that help you, or do you have to model it uh, empirically? And uh, uh, what I'm going to do is give you an overview of uh, some of the work that I'm doing with my students and, and staff in my group, and uh, hope that it might uh, stimulate some discussion. And maybe some of you will say, "Hey, I'm I'm interested," or "I." We work on similar things. Maybe we should talk. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, so I'm going to try and be tutorial and sort of convey some of the key ideas um, throughout. So um, the, the folks who are working on this presently, uh, it's uh, students and, and faculty and staff list, listed above. Uh, down below are sort of uh, uh, colleagues, so Jean and, and Steve and Reza and I talk about things related to this. And then there are several people that uh, have worked on it and are doing other things. And the work itself is funded by a variety of uh, sponsors. So uh, we've been doing work on uh, behavioral characterization of computer networks. Uh, CNO is computer network operations. Uh, uh, so this is uh, basically uh, network computer networks in conflict. Um, one of the projects there, number f the fourth one, realism of NCR traffic. So. Uh, the project there has to, it's, uh, Vincent Burke is the PI on that, and the project has to do with uh, how do you simulate a large computer network to do computer security simulations uh, in such a way that the, the traffic and the behaviors are realistic. So, so you can sort of simulate a lot of traffic, but it may not be what you really see in a network, um, and so on. So th there are some uh, projects. Uh, so, so I started with this uh, penny auction, that sort of, uh, uh, ridiculous, and I'm going to sort of transition to another example, uh, which is maybe sublime. So I'm sort of uh, the whole spectrum here. This is a memo that came out of uh, uh, the White House basically earlier this week, and it's a response to uh, WikiLeaks, right? So everyone's heard about WikiLeaks, and uh, there's a lot of concern now in the government uh, and, and also in companies about uh, exfiltration of uh, sensitive material. Okay, and I just pulled out of here um, one item. Here, I'll, I won't use my hand; I'll use this pointer. Um, what, if anything, have you implemented to detect behavioral changes 
in employees who have access to automated systems. So how do you, how do you make that operational? That sounds easy, but that's the sort of thing that, that we think about and try to, to do. Um, we started thinking about this uh, roughly three years ago, and we said, boy, this, would be, this is an area that, that would be really good to go after. And, and we started some of the projects that I listed earlier. And so we're doing a lot of case studies. And our goal is, uh, let's say, next year at this time, if I could speak, I'd love to come back and talk about a MATLAB computational behavioral toolbox. Here's the stuff that's in the toolbox. Here are the algorithms and the visualizations and, and things. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of things that we've done. But that's sort of uh, what I see as the next uh, synthesis uh, in our, in our program that we're working towards. Um, so another sort of a little bit of background on the way that we think about it. So this is uh, um, a little uh, present uh, sort of way to present the history of science as I see it and, uh, and, and put what we're doing in this context. So, so uh, going down is sort of historical. So ancient, uh, the way science was done 3,000 years ago was sort of pseudoscience, right? It was folklore and best practices and empirical experience. And uh, you know, ob objects were endowed with magical properties. And we still do that kind of stuff. Like we say, the Mac OS is more secure, right? There's no real empirical evidence for that, but it's, um, it's folklore. Uh, then, then we went through a period of uh, a long time where science was governed by the Aristotelian worldview. So Aristotle viewed the world as consisting of objects and relationships between objects. So it's really first order logic, first second order logic, where you, you can infer, make inferences using the, the principles of logic uh, about the world. And uh, there were axioms, okay, so you, you know, uh, familiar with some of that stuff. And, some of that, of course, like uh, 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 geometry uh, uh, survives, right? It, uh, it's, it's a rigorous way to reason about some things in the world. Uh, so in my timeline, the next big thing is Newtonian, and I'm counting quantum mechanics there, too. So the world has state, and uh, uh, science uh, describes the evolution of that state through various types of equations, differential equations, or partial differential equations, or Schrodinger's equation. And so you get certain uh, capabilities as a result of that. Then the next uh, big thing is uh, Darwin and uh, Adam Smith, where the world uh, is competitive. So there's finite resources. And uh, the solutions aren't minima, uh, like uh, Hamiltonian principles. The solutions are equilibria or saddle points. So uh, you get a different concept of a solution in a Darwinian or uh, a Smithian uh, model of the world. So game theory, utility theory, the games of pursuit and evasion uh, become relevant. And then the last uh, stage that I've got uh, is Kahnemanian. So this is uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman who won a, a Nobel Prize recently for uh, behavioral economics. So he sort of showed that game theory uh, is a great way to formalize and you can say, okay, the, the right way to play this game is uh, using a, a solution concept that let's say is uh, Nash equilibria. But people don't really do that. So it doesn't describe the world. So the economy isn't really described by the equations of economics necessarily, but how people behave or how people perceive things. So, so the shaded stuff is sort of where we live. We, you know, we've been modeling behavior as a dynamical system. Uh, it's in some cases competitive. And in, in many cases, uh, uh, it's not optimal anyway. It's just what people do and go figure. Uh, why that's the case. So, so I'm going to say a few words about what we mean by behavior and what our sort of framework is that I started with, and then give you examples of various uh, uh, things that we've done. So, you know, when an engineer or a mathematician gets up and talks about behavior, they say, well, you're way out of your depth. You should go, you know, psychologists have been doing this for 100 years. Go, you know, learn about behavior. So, so it's uh, amusing that last summer, so this is July 21. 2009, uh, there was an article in the New York Times that said, uh, uh, basically, behavioral scientists don't agree and don't have a definition of behavior. And, and so the, what I pulled out here, some uh, text here, it was a graduate student at Berkeley, was a TA in a class called Animal Behavior. And after the first lecture, he went to the professor and said, you know, 
uh, this was the first lecture, and you didn't define what a behavior was. And she told him, well, it's in the textbook. Go, it's a, the textbook is called Animal Behavior. Go read it. And there's no definition in the textbook. So, so then he sort of started uh, doing a little research and found that uh, you know, it's a very, um, actually ended up in a, uh, uh, an article that was published last in 2009, last summer as well, a year ago. Um, uh, do not agree on what constitutes behavior. So, um, so there, there are all these different things. So some of these things, like what is a behavior? It's what an animal does. Uh, 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 what an animal or plant does. Movements made by the intact animal and so on. So there's a very soft, not an operational definition of behavior. So that was a long-winded uh, way of saying that uh, I feel just as qualified to talk about behavior as anybody else. <clears throat> OK. So, um, so what do we mean by behavior? Well, it's something that's temporal, it's dynamic, um, uh, that you allow the possibility uh, that there are observations, uh, observations of a hidden state that you can't directly observe. And uh, the kind of formalisms that we're using are sort of drawn from automata theory and stochastic processes. So things like deterministic automata, various kinds of probabilistic automata. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about Markov chains and things, HMMs. And then, and then when you get into some of the more uh, dynamical adversarial things, I'll just give you some simple examples of uh, things towards the end of my talk that have to do with that. Uh, so, so that's what we mean by behavior. It's sort of stateful, it's dynamic. So it's, it's really like a, a mechanical system, but applied more generally to people, uh, groups, as well as machines and networks. So uh, th the next part of sort of our framework says, uh, uh, talks about uh, uh, the, uh, the order of a model. So uh, I'll walk you through, I'll give you some examples of this because uh, we're just sort of assigning labels to things that are fairly common already. So we have a zero first, second order model, and then an adversarial model. So a zero order model, think of that as just this, the vocabulary of things that are done, the vocabulary of actions. A first order is uh, those actions together with uh, uh, probability or frequency that they happen. And a second order, you're starting to condition and get the dynamics. So a second order model is Markovian or Newtonian in some way, that uh, the, the current action depends on the previous action, or the current state uh, depends in some way on the previous state. So you start this uh, conditional thing. And then the adversarial aspect is that you've got the environment actually becomes non-stationary because it's reacting uh, to you. Now the other dimension, uh, so that's sort of our taxonomy, uh, and I'll give you some examples. The other dimension to it is that how do people use behavior? Why, why does anyone care about it? And uh, uh, that example I gave at the beginning of a penny auction, if I could predict where this auction was going, I'd know where to jump in and, and buy that camera for $25, okay? If I could predict. So, so what is the next action? That's one way to uh, try to use a behavioral model. Another one is uh, uh, classification. So maybe I can't predict, but I can observe a behavior and say, this behavior is characteristic of um, a bad person, somebody's about to do something bad with high probability. Or uh, change detection, say, OK, somebody, uh, you know, George has been coming to the office every day at uh, uh, 9 o'clock, and all of a sudden he starts coming in at 7 in the morning before anybody's there. Why? You know, if you want to answer, ask questions like that, um, that's a different kind of use. And uh, we, when we sort of built this framework, we went through and thought, OK, can, you know, it turns out you, pop, you can populate this. I'm not going to spend any time giving you an example of everything here. But we convinced ourselves that there, in every, uh, for every type of behavioral model, people are trying to use it in one of those ways. And so it sort of seems to be a pretty good, robust, way to think about this kind of stuff um, in general. So let me give you uh, a very simple example to ground uh, uh, these ideas. So uh, think of a coin toss. I'm going to toss coins and record whether I get a head or a tail. So here's uh, a, a sequence of uh, coin tosses. So the zero order model is just the vocabulary. There's two possible outcomes in the sample space, a head or a tail. 
A first order model is basically the statistical characterization uh, of, of heads and tails. So half the tosses in a long sequence are heads, half are tails. Then a second order model starts getting more nuanced. So uh, uh, if I model this as a, as a one gram, no, I don't know if I'm, now I'm, it, let's just take this as a one gram. Probability of a head given that I previously saw a tail, that probability ends up being a half. So I don't do any better by modeling this coin toss, sequence of coin tosses, or being able to predict anything uh, by conditioning on the previous event. If I start looking at the two previous events, then, then I, uh, I'm in business. I can completely characterize what's going to happen next. And, and I don't do any better afterwards. Okay, So that's zero first and second order model. I'll give you an example of the adversarial framework for this uh, uh, later in the talk. So, um, so that that's uh, predictability. Uh, I can I can nail that once I get to a second order model. Uh, classification now. Well, is that a Bernoulli? Is it, is each coin toss independent? And it's pretty clear that according to the data I showed you, it's probably not. That would be very low probability that that uh, a fair coin would produce this sequence. So, is it a Bernoulli? Is it a is it some sort of a deterministic finite automata? How many states does it have? That's the kind of question you ask in classification. And then the anomaly detection question is, you know, can you observe the sequence and then observe a, a breakpoint where the statistics have changed in some uh, significant way? So that's sort of the, the way um, that we think. We, so we've, uh, our group has studied some basic algorithms and written some papers about how to learn automata. And that's a separate talk. I'm not going to. Go, go into that. And that particular work is uh, going to appear in um, IEEE transactions on information theory soon. So, so we, we can sort of design learning algorithms that learn these Markovian processes. And, and uh, there, there are many approaches to that. So, so what I want to take uh, a few minutes uh, next is to sort of give you examples and some of the challenges uh, that arise in this area. Uh, some of the examples are from our own work as well as others. So, so zero order behavior, just an example that everybody sees uh, about that is, for example, well, you get a resume and it says hobbies, fishing, uh, uh, watching TV, whatever. So, so people enumerate, this is a first order, a zero order model of this person's hobby behavior. They're just saying they do these things. This is the vocabulary of their behavior, but it's with no articulation of frequency or uh, dynamics. Do they do photography after playing the guitar or whatever? Um, so actually, um, those kinds of uh, zero order behaviors are very common in things that, uh, uh, for example, credit card fraud. So this is uh, an example of a bank uh, a protocol uh, that uses a zero order. So if you pull a credit card out of your pocket instead of out of your wallet or purse, that's an indicator that that card might be fraudulent or something. And so things like that. So it's not saying that uh, any frequency or anything. It's just the, the, the vocabulary is an indicator for something. Um, so one of the things that we've uh, done is we've uh, looked at uh, uh, in, in uh, traffic, uh, uh, network traffic that we can collect, we look at what computers does, you, does a computer connect to. So that ends up being a vocabulary. And can you uh, compare machines, again, without frequencies, just using uh, simple comparison to say uh, uh, the set of other machines that your machine has contacted, how can you cluster, how can you characterize machines based on just the IP addresses uh, that they're uh, contacting? And uh, so you can end up with uh, interesting sort of charts to say that you know certain uh, here, the diagonal, the light color means that uh, there's high similarity. So these machines uh, on the diagonal are compared to themselves. So they're all very similar. Now, here are two machines that are doing exactly the same thing. So maybe they're uh, mirroring each other. or Maybe it's a, 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 some sort of a server that everybody in a, in a work group is using. So, so we, that's an example of a zero order model. When you get to a first order example, this is a very common thing in network management. Uh, you see these sorts of little uh, dashboards where uh, 
uh, let's say somebody were to instrument the network here at Thayer, you'd say, what's the fraction of packets that are HTTP, that are web traffic, compared to FTP, compared to uh, mail uh, protocol, et cetera? So now you're saying not only what's the traffic, but what's the distribution or frequency of packets that arise with, with that characteristic or that um, in that type. Um, so uh, I'll tell you a little more about a student uh, that graduated this summer. It's uh, David Robinson. Uh, he's now a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. And uh, uh, he was trying to, uh, his uh, project, part of his PhD work, had to do with uh, the using really a first order model to characterize individuals based on their web browsing. So it turns out you can collect, uh, not collect, but you can download and obtain very large data sets of uh, computer users anonymized, but uh, you can see their, their web uh, browsing sessions. And so the challenge is, um, could you fingerprint individuals based on their web browsing? So if somebody uh, were to uh, uh, monitor what I'm browsing, which Google might do, by the way, uh, and I go somewhere else and start web browsing, how effective uh, can one conclude that it's me that's doing the web browsing? Okay, based on what I look at and things like that. Um, so, so what David did was uh, uh, he took every URL, let's say, for, for the sake of argument, every URL uh, can be characterized uh, semantically. So people have built these taxonomies of websites, and they're pretty exhaustive. Um, and so you sort of, if you look, were to look at CNN.com, that would be uh, uh, new in the news uh, bin. There are 17 categories at the highest level, and so on. So what uh, what David did was he sort of he he viewed every user as basically a first order model. There's 17 uh, bins, and then say, okay, I've got a, a probability vector or frequency vector with 17 coordinates. How well does that characterize individuals? And uh, uh, the kinds of results that he obtained was uh, in a group of uh, eight, 800 users, and I'm sort of skipping the details of the sampling and, and how much needed to be, how much data needed to be observed to build a profile and then sub subsequently to characterize uniquely. But uh, um, uh, 80, eight, out of 800 uh, 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 users that he looked at, that uh, you could uniquely characterize roughly 80, 85% of them. The smaller the number, of course, the more uh, robust this character characterization is. So there's an example that says you can uh, first order model based on that particular type of uh, uh, observation is a, is a strong characterization of, of uh, people's web browsing. Another example has to do with uh, characterizing uh, machines. So if you look at the traffic that's being generated by a machine, can you characterize that as a web server? That's probably easy. Uh, web server, can you characterize it as uh, uh, a particular type of uh, administrator, researcher, um, uh, some operational person in some way? And uh, uh, we've been able to do that sort of thing as well. So just to move along. Uh, to start talking about second order behaviors, now we're talking about probabilities of sequences of activities. So, so now we're talking about an, uh, an activity conditioned on the context of previous activities. Uh, so these are uh, sort of uh, traditionally called Markovian or Markov stochastic processes. And uh, I already showed you an example of uh, uh, that with the coin tossing. Uh, but one of the students, uh, Alexi, in, in our group, uh, applied that n-gram analysis to uh, cell phone data. So MIT, a group at MIT produced a data set uh, uh, of cell phone mobility. So they, they handed out uh, 100 cell phones to people and, you know, unlimited calling minutes. But the cell phone was instrumented and kept track of calls that were made as well as which cell tower was being connected to, okay? And so uh, 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 the data that Alexi uh, drew on was basically a, a string. So there's no time or anything, but it's just a sequence of cell towers that a cell phone was connecting to. And so that ends up being a signature 
uh, of an individual. And the question is, uh, you know, how well can you characterize or uh, fingerprint individuals based on cell phone mobility? So uh, I would say that this kind of work has actually been done quite a bit in Europe as well. Um, and uh, uh, the, the results are that in a particular group that he looked at, for example, uh, 40 people, uh, if you had 300 samples, then you could uh, uniquely, essentially uniquely characterize. Rank zero means that you're the top you match yourself best, better than anybody else. So um, another example of a second order model, uh, which is uh, sort of uh, outside the scope of what uh, I've talked about so far, has to do with NASDAQ trading. So one of the, one of the students in the group, uh, uh, David Twardowski, uh, you know, one, one of the challenges when you want to start looking at behavioral modeling is where are you going to get data? So who's going to give you a lot of data, let's say, about web browsing or credit card use or anything? It's hard to get. And uh, uh, it turns out NASDAQ provides uh, to academic institutions like Dartmouth basically uh, unlimited access to what's called NASDAQ level two trading data. So uh, to, to very quickly tell you what that is, is um, uh, this is uh, Microsoft. and uh, uh, in the course of a day, there might be a million orders for Microsoft on NASDAQ. And an order is somebody saying, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to sell 100 shares of Microsoft for $72. Somebody else is saying, I'm, I'm willing to buy it for $68, 200 shares. And so there's an order book. And whenever there's a coincidence in the, a match between the buy and the sell, a trade occurs. Okay, And uh, so this is a depiction of uh, uh, such a, uh, the noise here, and uh, I, you know, it's an eye chart here. But uh, basically, there are buy, buy orders, sell orders, and trades. Now, 80%. I said there's a million trades per day. 80% uh, of those trades are done anonymously, so you don't know. All you know is somebody made an order uh, for so much to buy or sell at a certain time of a, of a stock. And uh, to make a long story short, what what David's been able to do, this is sort of a depiction of that, uh, the order book on NASDAQ. Uh, what David's been able to do, I'm going to sort of cut to the chase here, is uh, uh, he's demonstrated that you can de-anonymize a large number of those trades uh, through various sort of uh, synchronization properties of, of the trading algorithm. So, so here's an example where, OK, the NASDAQ market is very complicated. It's very competitive. People are trying to, there's a lot of money at stake. Um, the, the trades are occurring at uh, five millisecond latency. So when, when a trade occurs, there's, five milliseconds later, there's a whole bunch of uh, reorders. The orders are reissued. So uh, these are not people trading in dark rooms with their sleeves rolled up. These are computer programs doing all the trades at five millisecond latency. So the challenge is, can you figure out what the logic of the programs is? But first, you have to say, who's, who's making these trades? And then you have to say, OK, can I build the automata? Can I reverse engineer the automata? Um, so, so David's uh, been having a lot of fun uh, doing this. And uh, if you want to hear more about that, you should corner David uh, or have him give the Jones seminar uh, someday. Uh, so another example of this second order using sort of uh, context and, and Markovian properties, it, actually in a more complicated way, is work that uh, Neil Sandel is uh, doing for his PhD. And uh, so here the challenge is uh, uh, to try to decouple so the, uh, uh, many observations into independent processes. So it's sort of de-anonymizing in a, in a, maybe in a different way. Uh, so the, the data that uh, Nils has been looking at is generated by computer science department here. They did a big study over the years about uh, uh, wireless access points. So uh, I'm connected to the internet through a wireless access point, and my computer's address, MAC address, is, is being registered. And so there's a database that's out there that says, you know, that MAC address was connected to this access point for this duration. And uh, uh, so what you get is some uh, uh, data set that this is over the course of a day in a building on campus. 
These are the number of machines that are connected at different times. And you also know the identity of the machine. It's anonymized and so on. But uh, 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 using a, a machine learning technique, Nils has uh, been able to uh, sort of uh, tease out what the class schedules are and things like that. So looking at uh, all this uh, aggregated data and sort of find out what are the business processes um, in the building. So uh, this, this chart depicts uh, some of the class meeting times as well as there are some machines that are persistent over the course of the day that probably don't have to do with students but with uh, uh, staff or faculty who are there all day. So finally, I'm going to say a few words about adversarial behavior. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, this is, I'm, I'm sort of anticipating next week's Jones speaker a little bit. So uh, in giving, again, this rudimentary example, um, maybe you'll appreciate some of the stuff that Richard Lippmann is going to talk about next week differently than you would without this. So. You know, most of signal, what I've been talking about is a very sort of uh, stylized version of what people do in signal processing and statistics and control, right? You sort of build a model of a system uh, empirically or analytically in some way. Uh, but usually the assumption in signal processing and control is that the environment is stationary. The statistics uh, in a Markov chain are not changing over time, okay? So it's a stationary environment. and. Uh, what happens if uh, the environment is conspiring against you? So that's what Richard's going to talk about uh, uh, very specifically. If I want to learn in an environment, I want to learn your behavior, but you're trying, to you're trying to stymie me. You know I'm trying to do that, and you're going to try and uh, make that difficult for me. What kind of dynamics does that create? So I'll give you a very simple example of where uh, these dynamics uh, and, and this is a, a subject that a couple of students, Tom House and uh, Gabe Stoko and I, are starting to look at. Uh, it's a very simple game of matching pennies. So, so let's say two of us uh, put a, a penny down. If, uh, if uh, they both come up heads, I win the penny. If they come up uh, t uh, tails, I win the penny. If they're different, you win the penny. That's the game. We just keep playing that game. Uh, so. Uh, how do you describe the behavior there? Well, one, one way to do it is to say, uh, I'm going to play heads and tails with some probability. So my probability of playing uh, a head is uh, Q, and the probability of playing a tail is 1 minus Q. You're going to play a head with probability P and a tail with probability 1 minus P. And this matrix shows the payoffs. Okay, So if this is a very simple game. The, the optimal solution is not a deterministic, it's a randomized. The solution is what's called a mixed strategy. And the Nash equilibrium is to randomize completely and play uh, heads and tails with probability uh, a half. Okay? So, so this is what you did if you, you know, this is very simple. It's probably on page three of a book on game theory. And if somebody knows the game, or you don't have to know game theory to realize this is probably the right way to play it, right? Uh, but this assumes that people know that this is the game. Okay, So this is the payoff. And, and this we agreed to the rules uh, before we started. Now notice if, let's say so you're dealing with somebody who doesn't quite know what the rule is. If they're playing heads more often than tails, so they're, they're playing heads here uh, more often, then your best strategy is to play heads all the time too. right? And you're, you're going to win with probability p bigger than a half more of the time. Okay, So you, you'll be able to exploit that. If they're not playing according to this uh, Nash equilibria, you can exploit that. And uh, your opponent's going to recognize that. And they say, boy, I should stop, play stop playing heads as much. Okay, And uh, so, so you end up with some dynamics. They're going to change the way they play. They're going to, and, and then you're going to respond to that. And it turns out that uh, uh, you can write down one model of that, those dynamics using what are called replicator equations. And so um, uh, these equations describe this best response. So I have two players, and they're, they're randomizing what they play. And uh, you know, there's a, I'm not going to parse the equation for you, but it basically says that uh, if you think through it, 
that uh, player uh, x, uh, if this expression which says, OK, uh, by playing i more, if I play i more, I'm going to do better than what I'm currently accomplishing, uh, then this, this expression is positive, And so I'm going to start playing the i-th move more. So if, if x prime is positive, I'm going to play that move more. If it's negative, I'm going to uh, de-emphasize it. And, and it turns out this, these equations have nice uh, uh, invariants that if, if, the, uh, you, if you start with x and y's that are stochastic probabilities, they always, the evolution is always a probability. It, it stays in the simplex. So, um, so people have been studying these kinds of dynamics for rock, paper, scissors. So this is sort of a state of the art in 19, uh, 2003. So this is seven, eight years ago. Is is pretty, uh, uh, it means there's a lot of work to do in my mind. That if we're sort of state of the art math paper deals with rock, paper, scissors in 2003, uh, there's a lot of opportunity uh, to make uh, new inroads here. But the point is that uh, uh, in, in this uh, setting, the environment is uh, dynamic, right? So you, when you're playing, you're adapting your play to what your opponent is doing. And they're doing the same thing. So it's not a stationary environment. And you can't model it in sort of traditional uh, stochastic process um, techniques. So in particular, uh, been starting to think about ideas of inverse game theory, where if you observe play that's dictated by a replicator equation, then can you infer what the uh, payoffs are? So what are the payoffs? If you uh, uh, observe play on both sides, and see how the other side's adapting. What can you say about the, the uh, systems that are actually generating that, that play? Actually, I think that describes most real world situations because the, the equations are not, uh, you know, we don't, uh, most of the world, most of life is not like chess, where the, here are the rules, somebody tells you, here are the rules, go play. Uh, most of life is you sort of got to learn, figure out how to negotiate with people as you go along. So um, uh, what Tom has been doing, uh, has uh, part of what Tom's been working on, has been to, uh, to look at playing against an adversary and from uh, their play be able to characterize, are they experts, or are they novices, or are they some combination of, of something else? And this is called hypergame theory. And it's really sort of inverse hypergame theory. Now one of the challenges there, and again, that's a, a subject of a separate talk, is when I'm playing a game, uh, and, and I think I can exploit somebody by playing. Uh, if, if they're not an expert, then I can exploit them and, and do some stuff and, and win faster or win more. Then I may actually make a bunch of moves that are not optimal with respect to playing the game, but they might have benefit in terms of learning about my opponent. So in poker, you, maybe you'll bluff or something just to see what your opponent will do and take a loss on a hand. Uh, for that reason. So, so this actually gets a little bit more complicated, where you are, need to explore an environment um, to learn about that. So I already showed you uh, this example of penny auctions, where people, it's really uh, state of the art in the sense of uh, this is around for a while. Again, I don't think it's going to be around. People at Stanford in the economics department are trying to model what are the dynamics of uh, uh, the optimal play here. And what are the optimal strategies? And they're looking at data uh, to see how that works. Another example that's very recent of uh, adversarial dynamics, and this is actually has to do with designing a game that has a certain outcome. Uh, this example is uh, what's called the DARPA Network Challenge. So about a year ago, uh, DARPA uh, proposed the following competition. Uh, they, were, they were putting up uh, 10 uh, red weather balloons in undisclosed places around the country. So they were going to launch uh, tethered balloons uh, on a certain day. And uh, there was a $40,000 prize for the team that would first identify correctly the locations of those 10 balloons. Okay, so uh, And you had to recruit this team. So for example, if uh, we said, OK, everybody in this room, we're on the team, it's not going to do us any good because one of the balloons was in Texas. You know? so, so you have to, very quickly, there was a, you know, this was announced. And 
and uh, the teams only had a short period of time to figure out a way to organize uh, a national response. And the other thing is that, uh, okay, you say, well, send me reports about where you think balloons are. And uh, if I'm on a competing team, I'll say, yeah, there's a balloon in Hanover. There's another one in Norwich. You know? so, so you have to build an incentive structure that rewards people for being honest and uh, uh, even in the, in the face of that competition. So uh, uh, the punchline here is that uh, the people at the Media Lab at MIT won this uh, competition. And they uh, attribute their success to designing an incentive structure where they anticipated the behavior. So it was competitive, right, as I described, uh, where the, uh, the behavior of the players uh, would be such that it would encourage the, the, the kind of response that they would let them win. So there, there are a lot of details in this, but uh, this is an example of sort of shaping behavior through uh, designing a particular uh, type of structure. So some of the general issues that uh, come up in this uh, uh, area that, that we're looking at is, you know, how much data do you need? So there, some of these things uh, uh, you can uh, are basically statistical questions, uh, like how much data do I need to collect before I can say uh, I've built a, a reliable estimate of a multinomial distribution or a reliable estimate of some probabilistic automata. Uh, and we've been looking at those things. An another um, uh, question has to do with uh, sort of risk assessment. And, and we've had some discussions with people in some of these uh, sensitive areas about this. Um, so uh, you know, if I, if I want to build a behavioral analysis capability and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trigger whenever, uh, whenever a credit card purchase has this characteristic, I'm going to stop it, and I'm going to investigate it. Uh, I'm going to make the cardholder call me. Now, if you do that in a sloppy way, you're going to lose a lot of customers because many of the calls are not, or many of the transactions aren't fraudulent. Uh, if you don't do it uh, precisely enough, you're going to get uh, scammed a lot and lose money. So, so it turns out that uh, uh, through some very simple sort of uh, analysis, that uh, what you want to do is you want to say the the probability. Um, uh, of a, a bad behavior, you know, the, uh, a bad transaction, given that uh, whatever you're triggering on in the behavior, uh, that that probability should exceed the cost of responding to a false alarm uh, divided by the cost of an undetected bad incident. So it turns out if you make some assumptions and simplify, this is just a very simple Bayes risk calculation. So we've had some discussions with people, and I showed you early on the memo from the president's office this week. What's the denominator here? So we can't help you unless you tell us what the denominator is. How much did WikiLeaks cost the United States? So they can't, you can't, uh, in some circumstances, you can't put a dollar figure on uh, uh, some of these events. Uh, so the other challenge, so you know, given what I just said, the. Uh, uh, the question is, how can you uh, suppose we want to monitor network uh, network activity or hosts at Dartmouth and say, okay, if a computer's acting strange, it might be uh, compromised, there might be malware on it. So, so let's build a model, statistical model of what normal is for each computer, and if it starts um, acting differently from that, uh, somebody from Keywit will come and, and check that it's not a bot or or something like that. So we've been looking at ways in which you can, uh, scalable ways to represent thousands of behaviors and say, OK, which ones are statistical outliers with respect to some metric? And, and where, can, where should you be looking at uh, uh, to focus your attention? Uh, another thread of our work has been on building a, uh, an XML type language, so a representation language for behavior. So, uh, uh, can I digitize these behaviors, zero first and second order models, uh, so that I can build databases of them and, and uh, compare them uh, in some systematic way? So that's the kind of work that we've been doing. And I rushed through some things, but I wanted to make sure that uh, we had some time for discussion afterwards. The techniques that we use uh, have a lot to do with uh, uh, we, we're drawing on ideas from uh, computer science, applied math, statistics social sciences, some game theory and things. 
Um, and and uh, I enumerated already some of the challenges uh, uh, that we face here. Uh, and I think that's the end of my presentation and leave some time for discussion. So, if there are any questions, yes? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's looking for uh, anomalous behavior, like a window that's open that shows us. Uh, okay. Well, I'd be very interested in uh, uh, meeting up with those people then. Yeah, we're not just talking about this one person, it's looking at the group, the group of students living in right. a group of uh, professors and students living in Yes. Uh, so that's a very good point that, uh, you know, I, I sort of was talking about. Uh, people or machines or uh, things like that. But you're absolutely right that uh, the concept uh, does include an organization. So um, uh, you know, some of the, especially when David was working on uh, his thesis, some of the uh, uh, people on his committee said, well, could you, for example, can you tell when a company's in distress? Can you tell, you know, and maybe that's uh, people suspect there's some impending uh, Layoffs or something, or there's some you know big change going to happen in the company. Could you uh, could you detect that or or some other kind of organization? So uh, so actually, uh, Benoit, if uh, uh, at some point you could introduce me to the people who are doing that uh, monitoring, I'd love to uh, follow up on that. Yeah. Any other questions or comments, uh, Jean? Um, so that that's a deep question, I think, because uh, uh, you know, and and it's okay. So let me see if I answer the question. Uh, I think when we think of game theory and all the exam, most of the examples in game theory and the games we play, the rules are specified, and this is what you can do, and this is what the utility is. When you win, this is when you win, and this is when you lose. Um, but but most uh, competitive situations uh, are uh, less well defined, uh, and so I'm thinking, including one of the projects that uh, Gene and I have started, has to do with the border checkpoints. So so how how do uh, bad guys, cartels, drug cartels, what's their game? What what's their set of moves? Uh, 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 how much uh, mobility do they have? Because we, you know, we're, our moves are to sort of set up checkpoints or, or uh, look at parts of the border more closely. And so uh, I think in those cases, you might start with some first principles. This is logical. But uh, in the end, you have to observe uh, uh, the data or analyze the data and try to find out what are the utility functions and how are people reasoning about uh, the environment. So I did. Uh, in, in that example I had of the replicator dynamics, I, I went over quickly. Uh, there's a lot more to it than I was able to say. So, so these uh, replicator dynamics assume uh, best response. So there's a certain type of logic that an adversary will use that leads to those equations. So there's, even though it's dynamic and I could learn something, I'm already making an assumption that that's how they're reasoning about it. And, and that may be false. So, yeah, so it, it's it's very complicated. <laughs> I agree, and and if you, I know you have a lot of experience in statistics. If if some of the work that you've done or are aware of can help us out, I'd really appreciate that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
so in, in the case of David Robinson, he was doing a, a variety of cross-validation methods uh, uh, to say, OK. Yeah, um, so that's, that's another one of these open areas here is that uh, or, model uh, order estimation for things like a hidden Markov model or uh, probabilistic automata is, is kind of a nasty area. So people have Bayesian ways to do that, and you, you assign some priors to the order and stuff. But uh, uh, it, it's still, yeah, yeah, I think there's no silver bullet there. Yeah. Yes, Daniel. <laughs> yep. Uh, um, so, I th I think from uh, the high level you could model that uh, you know with these kinds of equations or uh, uh, multiplayer game formalisms. Uh, but I think part of the question is uh, the way I would see it is uh, uh, can I uh, can I look at data and uh, from some play and infer okay what logic these people are using what so. Can I, inf you know, can I infer the behavior uh, and the logic of their tit for tat or tit for two tats or something from the multiple uh, plays of the game? So, yeah. So some of the stuff I showed you with Nasdaq that Dave Trudowski is doing, and what Nils have done is, is, is they're doing the source separation based on temporal synchronicity and and various sorts of. Uh, uh, ways to correlate events with each other. Um, no. So, so the stuff that uh, uh, NASDAQ is, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, David, he's, I know he's here somewhere. Uh, he doesn't have an adversarial model in there uh, where you have each trader competing against each trader. It's each trader is competing against some aggregate, aggregated market or reacting to the aggregated market. Yeah? Um, so I think I think the answer I mean the answer is yes that um, people want to have behavioral models Google is building uh, behavioral models of browsers of web browsers so that they can send you better ads and have a higher click through uh, so so there's a lot of interest uh, I had in a, a little box I wasn't able to spend time uh, Netflix so any any business that's in uh, doing recommender Amazon or Netflix, where they're looking at your behavior. You started watching a lot of westerns. Um, maybe you should uh, uh, have some westerns promoted uh, that you look at them, or you've been reading a lot of books on stochastic processes. You should get so people want people are building these behavioral uh, models of consumers, and and that is a very active area um, in the government. Uh, yeah, this. Uh, um, more and more uh, in the military, this is you know it's a big world out there. But the people that I uh, cross paths with uh, are sort of feeling you know that that our military success and some of the campaigns uh, aren't constrained by uh, our uh, 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 physical assets. So it's not we we're, we don't have enough helicopters or personnel carriers. It's that we don't understand the behavior or the dynamics of of that community and that society. Uh, or that particular uh, 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 counterinsurgency group. So can you build some behavioral model of those groups and the dynamics? So there's a lot of interest uh, in 
you know, and people are doing it right now in an ad hoc way. So they're building these models based on some expert uh, uh, characterization or expert guess, as opposed to data. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I I don't know. People, uh, I, I personally I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I know that uh, uh, airlines have been accused of doing that, right? They 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 change their prices depending on what time of day it is, and and maybe how much you've been sort of at their site and what you're looking at. So. Uh, Okay, so they don't do it. That's uh, Alexi worked there. Yeah. Yeah, so? I'm wondering if there are a lot of military applications here. Uh, I was just wondering if there are other countries or research groups that are publishing misinformation in the game theory field to show other countries. Are you a communist citation? Yeah, well, so uh, uh, I think it's pretty easy to check if. Uh, uh, you know, some analytic results are right or wrong, right? Uh, but but uh, maybe what you mean by is uh, people might feign that they're, you know, some country might feign that it has a certain capability that evokes a response from us that uh, wastes our money. Yeah. And we're doing that. I think we're doing that every day, right? I mean, I, I think that's uh, what the uh, a large part of the last 10 years, we're spending a lot of money on stuff that it's not obvious. Uh, we're spending it wisely. So that, I, I'm getting into some editorial uh, opinion here. But uh, no, I, one question I'll ask myself, because I'm surprised nobody's brought it up, is uh, this sort of, uh, isn't it kind of creepy to sort of start building behavioral models? Nobody wanted to ask that question? OK, John, well, what's your question? Well, actually, my, my question was, uh, is there sort of a, a human aspect to this? Because the Chinese government has Yeah. Um, so I I think most of what we're doing is assuming most of our systems are not are, they're natural because they people I mean people are natural right so but uh, is a computer user part of nature and to what extent are people um, you know organiz you know are we rational free will people, or we just, uh, you know, there's some deterministic. So our models tend to be probabilistic automata, and they're, we're reducing behaviors to sort of some automata or some uh, probabilistic model of behavior. There's a lot of data, there's a lot of data sh that shows that people are creatures of habit. You know, we tend to eat the same, when I go over to Burn Hall, I sort of get the same stuff, uh, you know, because I don't want to think too many, I don't want to devote too many cycles. Uh, I only have so many cycles available a day. And, and then, you know, we're also creatures of habit because, uh, like, Thayer School has uh, policies. I want to do this. Uh, there's a certain procedure. So, so we sort of, we end up being, I think, deterministic or to the extent that we are because uh, it's biologically necessary. We, we can't rethink everything all the time. So we want to, we go to default. So we end up having sort, some sort of deterministic behavior. And then society or the organizations in which we're involved also sort of uh, encourage some standardization, right? The, the, this is the way you do things at Dartmouth. This is the way you do things at, in the DOD or something. And so, so you end up with uh, 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 you know, human systems that I think uh, there are many examples where there's a lot of determinism, a lot of predictability. Yeah. Yes? Um, so that's that's where the adversarial uh, part comes in. Uh, so, um, and and uh, I'll make a pitch again for next week. Uh, the speaker next week is going to speak specifically about some computer security applications of this learning in an adversarial environment. So, uh, uh, for example, he's going to talk about spam spammers and spam filters. Right, so spam spammers know that we run spam filters, and so they're constantly reacting to the fact that we're trying to 
the guys who make the spam filters are constantly trying to see how the spammers are evolving. And so it's, it's a co-evolution. Uh, it's like that in computer security in terms of viruses and antivirus software. So I think, I think uh, very much so that people who are aware that they're being observed uh, try to change. Otherwise, they're going to be exploited. Yeah. Yes. Um, so th there's a, uh, a lot of sort of techniques uh, available, so I can't generalize, but uh, uh, things like uh, principal component analysis and uh, 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 various types of machine learning algorithms and so on that try to isolate which features or which attributes are most relevant to correct classification. So, so there's no one particular uh, technique. I, I think some of the slides that I showed, you know, we do use uh, principal component analysis and, and SVD type things. Um, one, of, one of the, uh, yeah, so I'll just leave it there. Yeah, good. I will cut this uh, short now and invite you to speak with George Stern 50 minutes after this uh, meeting. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you.